this is the Sony HDR MV1, and it's a very unusual little camera. You see, most cameras are designed around recording good quality photos and video. Now, this camera will record video, but its primary reason for being here is to record excellent quality audio. The idea is you'd take this camera out to some sort of music event and record an excellent quality bootleg with video to match. Alternatively, you could do something more legitimate and record your own band demo with it. Now, because it's a bit of an unusual camera, I want to tell you about the things it doesn't do first. Now, I don't want this to sound negative. All I'm trying to do is make you understand exactly what this camera is about. So the things it doesn't do are still photos. It doesn't have a zoom. It won't loop or recycle the videos. Doesn't put timestamp on them. Doesn't have motion activation or time lapse. It won't auto start and stop when it receives power. It's not waterproof. It doesn't have a touch screen and the screen isn't articulated, i.e. you can't move it. It's stuck to the side of it. Now here's what it does do. It records in either uncompressed linear PCM sound or AAC compressed audio. It's got XY microphones on the front that are at a 120 degree angle. You've got a mic in and a headphone out for monitoring the sound. It's got the XMOR R CMOS sensor, which is excellent in low light. It's got a wide angle lens, very wide. I think it's about 140 degrees. It's got Wi-Fi and NFC for transferring files across or control controlling it from an app. It does MPEG-4 video H.264 and records in either 1080p30 or 720p30. Looking at the box, it mentions music video on the right. There's lots of things about the music on the bottom, making you aware that this is a camera all about the sound. Now on the back of the box, there's a load of logos on there, which should tell you that the video hasn't been forgotten, but it's not the primary function. Now let's get it out of the box. All we get in here is the camera a USB cable, a lens cap, a battery, and a little string to hold the lens cap on, and some instructions, and that's it. We'll peel this uh, film off here so we can get rid of that uh, cheesy looking band and have a look around the camera itself. You can see the two microphones on the front in that XY orientation there. There's a metal bar around those to stop them getting bashed. The microphones look like you can move them, but you can't. They are fixed in that position. Now that metal bar is the only piece of metal on there because the other silvery bit here, that is made out of plastic as is the rest of the body of the camera, but very nice it is too, it's very well made. You've got two buttons on the top here, power and record start stop, with a little ridge between them so that you can feel where you are when you're just holding the camera, you don't have to look at it, and it's useful in the dark of course. Two buttons on the right there, we've got a play button and then a control pad with a clicker in the middle. You can see at the bottom there it says Wi-Fi, uh, reminding you about the Wi-Fi of course. A nice tripod screw mount on the bottom there, always welcome to get one of those. And access to the memory card there which will take M2 or micro SD cards, probably up to 32 gigs but it doesn't really say. And it's a better design of micro SD card slot than you get on the Sony action cameras, it doesn't wobble around. Now behind this door on the back we've got a headphone out little charge LED indicator below that. So then we've got the USB plug and we've got the HDMI out and we've got a microphone powered in three and a half millimeter jacks those by the way. It's nice that they're all on the back easily accessible even when it's on the tripod. Now on this side we've got a little speaker on the side there. This door slides off and reveals the battery which is a Sony battery that you get in a lot of their cameras now. I've got four different Sony cameras, all that use this same battery, so it's pretty easy to get spares of those if you need to. It slots in there, nice and neat, doesn't rattle around, uh, nice simple mechanism on that one. Now we'll just get the camera powered on for the first time, so if I press the power button here, just watch how long it takes to boot up. I say boot up because that seems to be what it's doing. There's a little bit of a delay here. Wait for the stuff to appear on the screen. That's my crossbars there, then the icons. Right, now you think that's a bit slow. Don't worry, that's only the first time you do it. Remember, I just took the battery out. For about an hour or so after that, it'll boot up as quick as that. It's instantaneous. I've never had a camera that switches on as quick as that when you want to start recording. You can get recording straight away when you see anything interesting. Now you can see on the screen here, lots of stuff going on. We've got the VU meters, I suppose you call them, at the bottom there. Uh, I've put my hand over the lens and froze the screen so you can see things a little bit clearer because the background there was interrupting the screen a bit. A lot of icons on there. You don't have to have all those. The ones down the left-hand side I put on myself. You can remove those if you want. Now, when we start recording, look what happens. It says record at the top, and after a few seconds, the screen blanks. 
Now you can still see it, I'll wave my hand on the left here so you can see that the screen is still working but it's very dim and in fact if you're outside you can't see that at all, the sun will bleach it out. Now that can be changed in the settings but you can see what they're doing here, they want the screen to blank out when you're recording, you're not supposed to be using the screen to frame the image, you just use it before and after for playback. Now if we go into the play menu here by pressing the little play button at the top, again you can navigate around this screen, uh, look at all the different things you recorded before, you'd think it was a touch screen looking at it, and uh, there is something about that later, it should be a touch screen but it isn't, well I'll explain more later. But on the screen here you can see you can play back videos I've recorded earlier uh, and you can adjust things like uh, move fast forward and pause all the rest of it and uh, you can delete files here, you can adjust the uh, sound on that internal speaker, it doesn't get very loud that though by the way. One nice thing about the on-screen menus is that they disappear after a second or so until you press a button again, so you get a nice clear screen with none of that on-screen clutter in the way. But that's enough peering at the clips on that little 2.7 inch screen. Let me show you them full screen. Now the first ones I'm going to show you all contain music that I recorded around Manchester. I don't go to concerts so I had to rely on buskers for my music but I'll warn you a couple of them get a little bit too loud but I'm going to be quiet now so you can have a listen. This is page talk to ground control. I'm stepping through the door.
I did the walk away on this last shot to show you how loud those chaps really are. They're much too loud, but the reason I wanted to record them is to show you how the microphone copes with loud noise, because of course at a pop concert or whatever, you'd be right up at the front hopefully, loud speakers in your face. That doesn't distort on this camera, which is a good thing. Now, one thing that you did notice there, hopefully, was that everyone was a long way away. And that wasn't because I was trying to get away from paying them, I did pay all those people I saw. It was because the camera has this wide angle that you're looking at now, which makes everything look very distant. That's about a 140 degree wide angle, I think, something like that. There doesn't seem to be any difference between 1080p and 720p as far as the field of view goes. And also, strangely enough, there doesn't seem to be much in it when it comes to video quality. Let me just show you that. I'm going to do a pause of the 720p now and do a crop right in the corner there. Now that's 720p and that's 1080p. You can't really tell any difference. All that's happened is a few people have moved. So I don't know what's going on there. The camera basically seems to record in 720p and then upscale it to 1080. Now I'm not saying that's bad because the quality of the 720p, if it is that, is excellent. I mean, it's really nice and sharp, but it's definitely not pin sharp like 1080p should be. It's a little bit soft. Of course, video quality isn't all about sharpness. Look at this clip here I took with a cheap action camera recently. Look how it makes the foreground much too dark because the sun behind the building affects the exposure. Now look how the Sony copes with that. I had both cameras in the same hand at the same time so this is what the Sony saw and I'll just spin around to the right and we've got the exact same scenario but look how much more you can see with the Sony camera. That's something to do with the way the Sony copes with exposure, quality of its lens, all that kind of stuff. Now, one thing the Sony doesn't have is image stabilization. This is me walking down the street now. Now, because it's such a wide angle, it doesn't have that much of a shaky effect that you get with a really narrow angle. But as you can see, it's not smoothing out the bumps like a um, stabilized camera would do. However, it's not every day that you manage to capture Santa doing his shopping. Now one thing that the Sony does particularly well, as with all Sony cameras I've tested recently, is low light. They're really good in the dark. Now remember, this is designed for you being at some pop concert or whatever, somebody singing on the stage, it's going to be dark, isn't it? You're going to have a few spotlights and things, but overall you want the camera to better record well in the dark without lots of grain. So look at this scene now, let's turn off the lights and see how it looks at night time. And there you go. Now the camera again, being a Sony, excellent low light quality. It's got one of these backlit CMOS, XMOR, R sensor things. You don't need to know all about that. What you can see is on the screen here, the camera copes really well in very dark conditions, as long as there's a little bit of light to light things up, but it gets all the color from a scene. You can see the purple in the back there, the different colors, lights up above. It doesn't have any grain at all on the image. It's a really good quality low light image. Now, I was carrying this camera around for most of December in my pocket. Very easy to carry this camera, nice and slim. It'll slide into an inside pocket quite easily on a coat. Very easy to pull it out quickly, press start, it starts recording almost immediately. So you can get some nice clips with it. Now, one thing with it, of course, it's got that screen on the side. You can't really frame things with the camera by looking at that screen. Try to stand side onto something and then adjusting the angle of it to shoot things in the right direction is very tricky. It's almost uh, like a puzzle trying to figure out that up is actually right and back is down and that kind of stuff. So really with all these shots, I've just been pointing it in the direction of my hand. You see, the thing is with it having that big wide angle lens on there, pretty much whatever you can see with your eyes is in shots as long as it's in front of you, of course. So I got a lot of really good shots like this one here and even got the top of the um, football museum in shot here. And if you look at the inside of the print works here, you'll see the camera again doing an excellent job with the low light that's in here. In fact, you wouldn't even know it was low light unless you'd have seen some of my other clips or I just told you now. Now, taking the camera around Manchester in December, there's lots of interesting things going on, such as this ice rink. Unfortunately, it's not as interesting as I'd want because no one was skating on it. They're all getting ready, but I couldn't hang around. I had to go off and do something else. But just standing on a street corner, pointing at a car, you can keep it perfectly in shot because of that wide angle. Now this camera is a little bit weird. Of course it's 
presumably based upon the Sony action camera which has a similar wide angle lens and it's got the various in outs for microphones and things so you can imagine the camera is related to that but of course this camera doesn't have that steady shot on it which is a little bit annoying I wish they'd pulled that across from the other camera but it does have a lot of other features on this one it's a pretty they just couldn't sort of merge the cameras together you've just got to bear in mind all the time you're using it that this camera is really not designed for what I'm using it for now it's for going to a pop concert or recording a live uh, recording of your band and it'll even let you just record the audio without the video which tells you how much it's into the audio recording now of course the audio is very important on these clips and I've been talking over it now I just want to show you a few clips together where you can just listen to the sound that comes across so you can get some idea of the sounds of the city quite good in stereo some of these because I've got a few things going sort of right to left and things so if you've got your headphones I'd suggest uh, put them on now and uh, I'll just be quiet for a minute and then you can have a listen to some of these clips. Oh, one other thing, it was very windy on some of these days when I was out recording and there's a lot of wind noise on the camera. Of course, having those big microphones on the front is going to pull across wind noise. Now there is a low level cut filter in the menus which I didn't have on through any of these clips which I probably should have had and might have adjusted for the wind noise but as you can see here this woman's either possessed or it's very windy. So I'll just shut my cake hole for a minute and let you listen to some of the sounds that the camera recorded. Right, that's all the footage you're going to get. Let's go into the camera and have a look at some of those menus, see how it operates. Well, we've got this four-way D-pad. You press it in to select something. As you can see here, I can move around the screen. The first one is recording mode. You can record a video or just the audio. Um, sometimes you might want to use this just as an audio recorder rather than a camcorder. Now record mode, you've got a choice between 1080 and 720, both at 30 frames per second. As we saw earlier on, not an awful lot of difference between them really. Now jumping around here, we've got the playback function, we saw that earlier on. Edit and copy, we can send files to a smartphone and maybe do a bit of editing in there. I never really went into that too much, but I'll show you the uh, sending them to a smartphone thing later. Now the setup at the bottom right here is a kind of boring setup. It's a usual thing like formatting the cards, changing the date. You've got four icons down the left here. You can jump to different bits of it or you can go all the way down it. Uh, like this. If you want to just jump to a section you go over to the left and you pick the icon that you want it gets into that part of the list. But usual stuff in there, nothing amazing. Uh, things like USB choices, Wi-Fi passwords, all that kind of stuff. This is the interesting one in the middle here. Camera audio. It's nothing to do with the audio. Well it is, but it's a lot of other stuff as well. Let's have a look through these things. You see we've got the same icon system on the left there, but uh, if we go down the list on the right one at a time, we've got the white balance first of all. You can select the white balance for a few different situations. It's a pity it doesn't tell you what they are as you move across them at the bottom there. You actually have to pick them before it tells you what they are. It will give you a live um, idea of what that looks like on the screen though, depending on what you're pointing at. Um, so we'll get back out of that. By the way, every time you select anything in that, like a properly change it and select OK, it throws you right back to the beginning again, which is a bit annoying. So I'll go through the others without trying to select anything. Exposure. I usually use auto exposure, but it does have an option for manual exposure if you really want to get into that kind of stuff. Useful if you've got it maybe on a tripod and you're sort of pointing it. You could get it set up just how you wanted. Scene selection. It's got your usual things here. you got auto and then you got sort of uh, a, a sunny or 
fireworks, all that kind of usual stuff that they have. However, over the screen, there's one particularly useful one for this camera, uh, which is spotlight. The idea is if you're at a concert again, someone's got a bright spotlight on their face, you can still see their face rather than a bright sort of ghoulish blob. You can put faders between each clip. You can uh, do face detection on it. Now, audio format, that's where you select either linear PCM or AAC. AAC apparently can be played on more things. It's more compatible. Linear PCM is supposed to be less compatible, but my editing package on my Mac here imported it fine. Low cut noise filter. This is what I should have had on in some of the sort of rumbly windy scenes, which might have reduced that noise. I've never tested it, but I'll have it on from now on. Hopefully that will improve future clips. Actually, while I'm here, you might have seen this clip that was in one of my recent dash cam reviews. Um, that was recorded with this camera and had a terrible rumble on it that people said really gave their subwoofers a workout. That would have been a good time to have used that low-level filter. Now you can change the internal mic levels, you can move those up and down to just how you want them, or external ones if you had one plugged in. You can adjust the audio output timing so you could listen to uh, your lip syncing or have it live. This is if you're feeding it back to someone that's actually singing and recording them at the same time. A bit complicated, but if you know all about this stuff you know what that's about. Uh, volume again was the speaker volume, and then you can ha uh, change the external input to be a microphone or a sort of auxiliary in device. Now you can control it with your smartphone, I'll show you that in a second, but that's about uh, starting and stopping the camera basically using an app on a smartphone or tablet. My button is where I put those icons that were on the screen at the left. Those are the ones that you like out of the list, the ones that you think you're going to use the most. You can put those on the left of the screen so you've got quick access to them with just a, a few moves of this uh, joypad type thing rather than having to delve right into the menus. The grid line, you'll notice I had that on. I always use grid lines to make things nice and straight, but you can turn that off if you want. The audio level display, you can have it on or off on the screen, and you can have the uh, monitor off uh, disabled. That's the thing that makes the screen go blank. You can have it stay on all the time you're recording if you want to. Now, looking at these menus, I mentioned before a couple of times that they really look like they should be touch screen menus. And uh, that's uh, borne out particularly by, look at this blue box. Look how it goes over the N in on and over the B in beep. It doesn't look like it should be there. It looks like someone's just sort of tacked it on on the top in a hurry. And that's true, they have. Because this is what the real menu should look like. This is another camcorder I've got, a Sony one, that uses the same menu system, but on this it's actually a touchscreen system. So it shows you it's supposed to be a touchscreen uh, system, but it isn't on this camera. But however, that's not a bad thing because it does make sense. You see, if you're holding it in your hand like this, your thumb is touching the screen. You'd much rather have a little joypad at the back that you actually have to select purposefully because if you were holding it above your head at a concert or something, you're going to be selecting all sorts of things on a touch screen uh, or even if you hold it like this down by your side. So you can see why they did away with the touch screen. Maybe they thought they'd do it to start with and change it later or something. One other thing I don't like about it though is this lens cap. Very useful to have a lens cap, stops it getting scratched, but it's really annoying the way it hangs down like that. Very hard to put it in your hand and to keep recording with it because it's just such a bulky sort of of thing it, it's hard to keep it with you so I'd suggest not putting it on the string and just having the lens cap and stick it in a pocket or something now if you're at a concert you probably have the camera up above your head like this and record notice how the screen goes blank the person behind you they're only going to be looking at that that is an awful lot better than someone looking at the back of a smartphone that's recording a concert which seems to be what everyone's doing nowadays rather than having a blinding screen in your face you've just got a little bit of a black sliver much more polite to your concert going friends and I found that this camera was very good for discrete street photography. Holding it down by my side here, that nice wide angle lens got everything in shot and nobody really noticed that I was recording. Now one thing I don't like is the record light. It's got this little red LED on the front, that's fine, that's okay. It needs another one though, it needs either one on the top or on the back. When you're looking down at the camera or from the back, you've got no idea whether it's recording or not. There's no indicators on there at all. And the screen will go blank as well, so that doesn't help you out. Now let's have a look at that Wi-Fi setting. First off, you turn the setting on in the menus. It gives you the SSID and the passwords. So all you have to do is get your tablet, smartphone, whatever, download the Play Memories application, and then connect up via Wi-Fi to the camera. It then lets you see what's happening live on your device's screen, and you can also start and stop recording. There's applications for Android and for iOS. 
Now this uh, application doesn't have an awful lot in it. The other thing it lets you do is change it into the music mode. And that's about it, at least on my thing it is. Uh, the other thing you can do is go into the menus, uh, get into the playback stuff and send files across. This is looking at what is on the camera. It's streaming the information from the camera as to what the clips are. It's getting the little thumbnails across to the uh, iPad here. But if you actually want to get the video files across, you go into one of them and you put a tick next to it and you can put a tick next to as many files as you want. And then once you've uh, picked the file, you can uh, um, pick whether you want it in VGA or in the full 2 megapixel, that'll be the 1080p resolution. Once you're happy, uh, press the button and then it transfers it very slowly. It took, for that 20 second clip, probably over two minutes to transfer across. What it does, it goes into your photo folder and then you can just play it back as a, a video as though the um, iPad had recorded it itself. Now obviously this would be simpler to set up using the NFC chip if you had a compatible device, but it wouldn't be any faster at transferring those files across. Now let's plug it into a television using a micro HDMI to full size lead that I've got separately. It doesn't come in the box. It lets you view what the camera sees on your TV screen. You can record and view it live as well. And you can of course play back clips that you've recorded earlier on. Nice and sharp on the TV there. Also it doesn't have all that on screen clutter that you get with some other cameras when you attach them up via HDMI. So that works really well. It lets you get into the menus as well. You can look at all the different things that you could do on the side screen on the camera you can do on the TV screen. If you attach the camera up to a computer using the supplied USB lead, there's two different drives show up. One has all the usual files, your video files. The other one has these things, which are links to things on the Sony website, which will allow you to download editing packages, stuff like that, for either Windows or OS X. I've pulled some stats off the Sony website, so hopefully these are accurate. If you're looking at the bit rates, variable bit rates on this camera, if you're recording in 1080p with the AAC audio, that's 16.2 megabits a second, or if it's linear PCM, it's 17.6. Battery life, my own test, got about 2 hours 20 minutes out of it, that's with the screen blanking out. Those are your dimensions and the weights, the weights I measured myself as well. So to summarise, this camera has particularly good sound quality, which of course it should do, bearing in mind that's the whole purpose of the thing, but you've also got a lot of control over that and you can plug different things and all that kind of stuff. If you're into sound, then this is a good camera for you. It's got excellent low light video quality as we saw. I like the size and the shape, personal thing, but I really like the way it looks and I also like the build quality. Now on the negative side, it's got that soft 1080p, which pretty much looks like 720p. It's got a very niche purpose. There's an awful lot of cameras out there that do multiple things. This camera seems to pretty much just do one thing. So if you don't need to do that one thing, you want to look at some other cameras, I think. It's got a very wide angle lens, which of course is great for getting lots of things in shot. However, if you imagine the purpose that this camera is designed for, which is going to some music events and concert, the stage is normally a long way away and the people are very small. But just imagine how far away and how small they're going to look with that wide angle lens. It could do with the record indicator light on the top or the back, and I really wish they'd put stabilisation in this camera. As the smartphones have eaten away at the compact camera market, the camera manufacturers like Sony have had to look at different areas in which they can sell cameras. Things that smartphones don't do very well. So they've been selling cameras with massive zooms, excellent low light capability, and in this case, a particularly good sound recording ability. Although I'm not too sure that there's that much of a market for this camera. I don't know how many people really need a camera like this, but I suppose only time will tell. Now, if you want to buy one of these, there's links in the video description. I've got some Amazon links up there. I've also got a link back to my blog. I'll put a couple of little clips up there so you can hear the true sound quality, not the YouTube re-encoded one. But that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.